Jason Barrett on, uh, a bourbon collecting bearded businessman. I got to have a Macho Man theme song for him to get him on here today. The village well, people. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, thank you. You don't, you don't you don't think you're a macho man? Uh, yeah, it's summer. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, we just finished with Delegate Hornby, who tells us that the House is at a standstill over religious freedom regarding uh, vaccinations. Uh, is there anything such as that circulating in the Senate at the moment? There is a bill uh, that provides a religious exemption, uh, and I believe the original bill had philosophical exemptions uh, as well. Um, I, I'm not sure uh, if that bill is going to move forward or not uh, this session, um, but I did get to, I did see uh, the what uh, Delegate Steele uh, did yesterday with uh, attempting a discharge motion uh, to discharge the bill directly from committee to the floor, uh, and then that, that motion then was uh, uh, tabled, um, and then there was a vote to table the motion, so the discussion I wasn't had, and that's, I mean, that's, that's something that goes on frequently in the House, that there are discharge motions, and then typically the majority leader, whoever that is, and in the past it was Amy Summers, now it's Eric Householder, they immediately get up and table that motion and um, try to move on, and I think Delegate Steele was upset that he didn't, uh, that the motion wasn't debated, uh, it wasn't taken up, it was tabled, and so I think his uh, response to that was to have the bills read, and uh, that's having the bills read in their entirety is, is something that I absolutely do not miss about the House of Delegates. <laughs> uh, and regarding you bring that up here, you're in the Senate now, and for what ten years you were in the House. Eight. Eight. Okay. So give me an idea of the deliberative process difference between the House and the Senate in regards to getting legislation introduced, considered, uh, and passed. Well, and I don't. I don't want to. I'm happy to do that, but I don't want to take. I don't say this to take shots at members of the House or the way the House of Delegates operates. Uh, it's just a little different in the fact that you know we in the Senate we we do a lot of committee work. We we meet uh, our caucus meets a lot to discuss bills and, and where we're at and what we like about particular bills and don't like. Um, you don't see a lot of speeches on the Senate floor. Um, and the more the speeches happen, the less you get. The less time you have to. Uh, to meet in committee because the floor session floor session drags out, and every once in a while, you, you know, somebody will give a speech about something that they're really passionate about, or or that, that if there's things in the media that have been um, inaccurately portrayed about a piece of legislation, they'll they'll want to get up and, and clarify that. Uh, but in the House of Delegates, it's it's very different. Uh, you know, there are and, and it's a lot of the same members that get up a lot and, and offer a speech on on just about anything and everything, and um, it. You know, they obviously have every right to do that, but uh, th this really began uh, common practice once the cameras were in. And the cameras are great for transparency to people to see their government, uh, but at the same time, members are aware the cameras are up there and they can uh, clip that video and put it right into Facebook immediately. And um, so it, it's a tool that, you know, and, and it's, you know, it's a tool that they use to, to be able to inform um, their constituents as to what they're doing, but. And it also helps with name ID and getting yourself out there. So uh, that's my take on, on some of the differences between the House and the Senate. You're on the Finance Committee, Vice Chair of GovOrg, obviously. Let's talk about finance because uh, Mike okay. just finished telling us that in the House, right now, nothing that costs money, if it has a fiscal note associated with it, it's not going anywhere until this tax cut stuff gets settled. Are you in a similar situation in the Senate? Well, I think that we've been... Um, done a really good job with our process here in the Senate of, of prioritizing some of our spending. We have passed a few bills this session that have uh, um, have a price tag on them. Um, one of the bills that we passed out um, yesterday was a, a pay raise uh, for state employees. I believe that works out to about $2,300 per employee. Um, we also passed out a bill that uh, tries to make changes and fixes to PEIA. And, um, you know, none of us want to, to have to increase premiums, uh, but at the same time, you know, we can't continue to, to ask the taxpayers of our state uh, to, uh, you know, circumvent the, the process by which PIA premiums go up and, and filing tax dollars into the PIA reserve fund to stabilize premiums and, and not make it go up. And, um, you know, I think that the folks in the private sector that have insurance have seen drastic increases to their premiums over the past 11 or 12 years. And if you look at uh, the, the monthly premium uh, 
for PA on plan A, and there's plan A, and there's, and there's plan B, and plan A is, is the more uh, costly plan. It, it's a better plan. It has, obviously, more coverages. But in 2012, uh, the employee salary level, level one, which is the lowest uh, level of, of uh, salary for the state. In 2012, that premium was $63 a month. Today, it's $64 a month. Uh, on the high end, salary level 10 in 2012 was $247 a month. Today, it's $249 a month. Um, and there is no uh, private health care plan that I'm aware of that has similar uh, trend lines where it's completely flat. So, you know, we're looking at making some changes to PEIA. Um, and you know the premiums are going to go up some, but the, the pay raise uh, will more than offset um, that premium increase for all state employees. I found uh, some of my wife's old pay stubs because she works uh, at the federal government. She has our health insurance, and a d- dozen years ago, the, the premiums were like seventy nine dollars a paycheck, and now they're six hundred something dollars a paycheck. So there has been tremendous inflation in health care premiums, without a doubt. Yeah, and if you look in the out years, specifically uh, fiscal years 25, 26, and 27, the amount of state uh, direct transfer from general revenue, this is taking money out of general revenue that taxpayers pay and directly transfer it uh, into PEIA to, to freeze premiums, which is what the governor has wanted to do for a number of years. If we were to do that in 25, it would cost $204 million dollars. In 26, uh, it's about 283, 284 million dollars, um, and then in 2027, it's 300 and I believe 76 million dollars. So, uh, you know, you, you look at that, and uh, that's just not sustainable. And, and that's just a 2027. So, if you look in the out years beyond that, that number continues to grow, um, and, and that's not fair to the taxpayers of West Virginia. Bill, yeah, uh, Jason, there's a, a bill that. Um I don't know where it is now, and I'm not sure if it uh, originated in the House or the Senate, but it regarded uh, paying the jail bills, and it was a very convoluted formula. Uh, are you aware of this bill, and is it a Senate bill or is it a House bill? Well, I drafted it, so okay. I'm aware of it. Okay, good. Yeah. And I think convoluted is an unfair characterization. No, uh, no, I, I think it was a very, okay, convoluted. Let's say a very, <laughs> a very, a very complex formula that you have to, you have to work your way through. Is that what so I'll, uh, I was just giving you a hard time, Bill, but, yeah. but I appreciate you bringing the bill up. That's uh, Senate Bill 596. Um, actually, several months ago before the session started, the president asked me to, to look at the jail cost and figure out a way um, to, to revamp that and, and do that a different way because, um, you know, jail costs in some areas are going up. Some counties are doing a good job reducing their jail bill. We have frozen the jail bill uh, for the past three legislative sessions at $48.25 per night, uh, and that doesn't accurately reflect, reflect what the actual cost is. And the budget office puts out what that amount should be. And that amount currently is $54.48. So I came up with a formula to, and I like to do things in formula that way. We're fair to everybody. We're fair to large counties. We're fair to small counties. We, we treat everybody equally and fairly is, is the way I want to do it. So I created a formula uh, that looked at the number of uh, billable nights over the past three years in our entire state. And I took that average, and then I divided that by the population of the state of West Virginia. Then I apportioned that to every county using that pro rata calculation. Uh, In doing that, it gave an allotment to every county of the number of nights that that they should have based on their population. Um, And then from there, um, because I believe counties have some control over their jail bill, but but there's some things that are out of control, uh, out of their control. That's that's. Um, the, the crime that's um, magistrates, um, you know, setting unreasonable bail, um, setting uh, not setting bail or not letting people out when they should, and some of that goes on in, in our area, unfortunately. And so that's out of the county's control. But things that are in the county's control are things like very active and, and good day report centers, uh, home confinement, recovery resource centers, those things all help bring the jail cost down. So what I decided to do was take that $54.48 number, and for the first 80% of the nights that the county has towards their allotment, would receive a 20% discount on that. Anything above 80%, they would pay the full price at $54.48. Anything above their total allotment uh, in, a, in a year, 
then they would pay a 20% penalty. Um, and so that's a way, I think, to incentivize counties that have done a good job of investing money on the front end to reduce their jail bill and to help people uh, get into rehab, uh, get, get their lives back on track and become productive members of society. It encourages all those things. And then the counties that refuse to do that um, and, and don't care about their jail bill, then um, they'll pay the penalty if they go over their allotment of nights. And that's, that's what the bill does. And it, it sounds far more complex than it is, uh, but I think it's very simple. And I think it addresses the problem moving forward. The legislature doesn't have to come back and and um, freeze uh, the jail cost anymore. As the budget office uh, reevaluates and reassesses uh, the, um, the actual cost per night, uh, that will continue to go up, but the discounts and the penalties will stay in there. Uh, every 10 years following a census, uh, that formula is recalculated based on the number of nights and, and the population changes within each county. I understand from Berkeley County's perspective, there'll be a savings of approximately $200,000 uh, with the way they understand the bill right now, which is, I think is very good. Uh, a question, another question with that, uh, uh, Senator, I understand there was an amendment that was uh, submitted that would make the county commissioners personally responsible if they did not meet these criteria, but that amendment was, was defeated, correct? Well, that's, that's actually not true. It's already in the bill that they're personally responsible. There's case law that already indicates that if, uh, if a county commission or county council does not uh, pay, their, pay their bills, um, then they are personally responsible already. This just codifies case law. Um, there are a handful of counties that do not pay their jail bill. Um, and I think that you know, some of them are, are spending money on things that, that are, they're not statutorily obligated to pay. Uh, but they're doing it anyway and not paying their jail bills. So, um, you know, again, there's case law that already indicates that this that commissioners are personally responsible if, if they um, neglect doing their duty. And um, as it relates to paying their bills, um, this just puts, this, puts that in code. Can we stay on jail bill for a second, here, Marie, before you go? Yesterday, Vice President of the Berkeley County Council, hopefully soon a commission, Eddie Gokenauer made the statement that the jails are owned by the state, the state should have to pay the jail bill. Why do the counties have to pay the jail bill, period? Well, I, I understand that. And it used to be that there weren't state jails. There were county jails. And the counties That's right. took them all. I mean, the county paid all of the bills for that. And, and it was the county's responsibility to, um, you know, to house those folks, to supply correction officers to those folks in the past. And, and now the state took it over in an effort to help counties. Um, but I, the problem is, and, and I understand uh, the, uh, Councilman Gokenauer's position on this, and I think Berkeley County uh, has, and Jefferson County really have done a great job in reducing their jail bills. Um, the problem becomes if, if, we're, if the uh, local law enforcement are making arrests and, and uh, magistrates are, are keeping people in jail too long, um, you know, and the, the county has absolutely no skin in the game. I think that you're going to see jail bill, the jail bill go through the roof because the state's on the hook for paying it all. And the folks that are that are making the jail bill go up don't have any incentive or penalty um, for for ensuring that the jail bill is, is that they're mindful of the jail bill and that they want to reduce it. So that's I think the county has to have some skin, skin in the game. Uh, I, I think that Again, that's the reason for this this formula and this uh, discount and this uh, incentive of a twenty percent reduction um, because they you know because they don't they they don't have total control of it and they have you know minimal control. Um, so I think that's the reason that that we would want to uh, you know to incentivize them and and try to reduce the jail bill for them. And, and so really, the jail bill is if, if we do nothing if this bill does not pass and, and we don't act on this. The jail bill for every county is going to go up substantially. They're going to go from forty-eight twenty-five per night to fifty-four dollars and forty-eight cents per night. Uh, so you, you know, calculation, calculating savings, you really need to calculate it based on what it's going to be at fifty-four forty-eight, not what they're currently paying at forty-eight twenty-five. Maria, so, so it's even a, it's even a larger savings for Berkeley and Jefferson. So do you feel like Jason that this is going to? I mean, obviously the Senate side um, is there momentum on the house side to make this to make this happen well i think so and i, I think that the contentious part really becomes that part of the bill that that puts in code that they're personally uh responsible for yeah. it um, yeah. but i think the formula if the formula doesn't pass 
uh, every county commissioner in the state uh, should blame uh, they should. I, I shouldn't say that. Be- before that happens, every county commissioner in the state should call and reach out to their delegate and, and inform them of what this bill does to save the county money on their jail bill. Gotcha. Even gotcha. though it codifies case law that says they're responsible yeah. for pandemic. And, and, and I've talked to the folks in Berkeley County before. They're already aware of this case law, and they're already aware that they're personally responsible for it. And, and you know, Jefferson and Berkeley County, they pay on time. Uh, there, there are no issues with any of the eastern panhandle counties uh, as it relates to paying their jail bill. There are a few others that, that are in the rears by a couple of million dollars, um, and that's unfair to the rest of the state. I mean, if there's no penalty for not paying the jail bill, then at some point, all these other counties are going to say, you know what, we're not going to pay it either. Well, uh, so there, there, there has to be, um, you know, the, the, the counties have to be on the hook for paying this. They, they can't just ignore it. And Jason, I think you made reference to the other things that these counties are doing here, day report, um, mm-hmm. drug court, those kinds of things. And I'm not certain that that the community at large understands sort of the benefits of all of those programs because you know there are there are some who have the mindset that a criminal slap them in jail give them the maximum sentence and don't see you know the whole cost picture of this um of this piece yeah if memory serves maria uh berkeley county has a savings of two to three million dollars per yeah. year due to day reporting center and alternative mm-hmm. sentences yeah so. yeah and again that's the reason for this formula that's the reason to give a discount on those the first 80 percent of nights um because uh when, when these counties invest money uh, and resources on the front end they they should have some cost savings on the back end and that's the point Sure. And you make a great point. I mean, Maria, they, what, what Berkeley County and Jefferson really, the day report centers that they have, uh, all the things with the recovery resource centers uh, really make an impact not only on the jail bill, which is important uh, to taxpayers, but they, they really make an impact on people that have gone down the wrong path that uh, suffer from addiction and substance abuse, and they really help get them on the right track and, and get them again to uh, back on the right track and uh, becoming productive members of society and, and, and get good jobs and, and, and move forward with their life. That's, that's the more important part of this. I have about two minutes left, Jason. What's important to you that you want our listeners and viewers to know about? Well, and today in Senate Finance, we are going to take up a bill that moves uh, the, that allows 911 workers uh, to move from the PERS system, which is the Public Employee Retirement System, over to the EMS Retirement System. You all will remember last year um, I was able to get a bill passed that, that put our county firefighters from PERS into the EMS uh, system, but that bill also allowed new hires starting July 1st, I believe, of last year that allowed uh, new hires for 911 operators uh, to, to go into EMS. Uh, but the existing existing employees were not. This this sets up a way uh, to allow those to uh, allow those employees to get into a little more lucrative EMS system. Okay. So we're taking that bill up today, and, and we'll vote it out. Um, I would looks like early next week. It's kind of a mechanical question, uh, Jason. I remember last year the EMS folks were very happy, very thrilled that you were able to do that. Uh, what is the funding mechanism for EMS over the PER system? What is the funding? Yeah, where, where are they getting the money from? Is Are there enough contributions uh, within the EMS structure or the 911 structure to ensure adequate insurance coverage? So, well, with, it, with the last year with the 22 firefighters in Berkeley County, uh, the, the plan just incurred the cost to do that. But with 700... Um, 700 plus 911 uh, workers across our state. The, the plan can't absorb that cost, uh, so there, you know, th- there's going to be a price tag for these employees to go over to that other plan where they could buy they could buy into the plan at the same uh, number of years of service, or they could sacrifice a couple of years of service to get into the better plan. Um, certainly, the county can help with that. Counties can help with that if they choose to, uh, or it could be on the employees. Uh, but the 911 uh, centers across the state uh, have been extremely supportive of the legislation. Uh, and there's a process by which they would take a vote, um, and, and they need you know enough support to be able to move from the Jason, first system to the EMS. On that note, we're out of time. Thank you so much for yours, sir.